everybody. I'm Pamela. I'm a senior software engineer in Credimi, that's a startup based in Milan, and then CTO of SheTech Italy, that's a community always based in Milan, whose mission is to empower women in tech. Today, I'm here to talk to you about how we have used Hazura in Credimi for helping us to develop new features. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to tell you what Credimi is. We are a startup born in 2016 in Milan and we are in fintech. Our main businesses are invoice financing and medium long term loans. And uh, we have loaned so far 930 million Europe and that made us the uh, leader digital lender in continental Europe. I'm going to tell you today how we have used Hazura to improve the time for, for us to deploy feature in production, as well as how we have used GraphQL to improve the developer experience by allowing our developers to focus in delivery on business value. But before I go into detail, I'm going to tell you a story. So this is a PM. A PM in Credimi that arrives one day, he has this brilliant idea that's going to make our customers very happy. And of course, the developers are really excited to jump on the project, they start working immediately, and they are ready to eventually release the feature to production. So release date, everybody's happy, our customers are happy, everybody is celebrating. But the day after, the PM comes back, he has yet another idea to make our customer even happier if it's possible. But we have to, we as developers, we have to get rid of half the code we have written, we have to remove half of the feature, and we have to deploy yet another changes that we were not able to anticipate. The, de the developers know that they're going to delete a lot of line of code and that they're going to do write uh, some boilerplate over and over again, so they're not quite happy this time. Um, so basically, when you work in a startup, of course, you have to um, deliver your features as soon as possible to uh, deliver um, nice user experiences to your customers. And from a developer point of view, that means that you need some versatile tools that allow you to build on what you already have without necessarily go back, get rid of what you've done, and then building something up that maybe will need to be rolled back again. Um, and that also means that the developer needs to focus on delivering value that just don't want to spend time leading and writing code all over the places. Um, to argument this, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how Credimi used to work. This is Credimi 1.0. We're talking about two years and a half ago. We used to have a bunch of microservices written in Scala mostly. Um, we had um, an AngularJS application client facing that was interacting with the first layer of backend written in Node.js. And the complexity of all the microservices was hidden by this Kubernetes ingress that was um, taking all the requests from the node and was redirecting uh, them to the right microservice. So I'm talking about Kubernetes here. All our microservices are deployed as a Docker image in a separate pod, and each microservice has its own database. And the communication back then was mainly relying on REST APIs. What does this mean? This meant that we had several problems. Uh, the first one being boilerplate. Whenever we needed to add a new API, we needed to write a lot of code from down to the database up to the REST layer. And then also we had to remember, for example, to add the, um, the API at the Nginx level, that's the ingress I was talking about, otherwise the API would not be reachable. That's a quite, quite a lot of boilerplate to write. There was no schema shared between the back end and the front end. So even a small typo was giving us problems when developing the new feature. It was kind of like tricky to understand where the communication was breaking. Authorization, why am I talking about authorization? Because um, I told you guys that we were doing uh, invoice financing. And after a couple of years, the invoice resource, remember that we, are doing, we were doing REST back then, the invoice resource was quite huge. We had almost 60 fields on it. 
And every time, maybe the front end would query the API, the front end would get the full resource back. That means that even if the front end needed two or three fields, it was still getting the full resource. And if any of those 60 fields was not necessary to the client, or maybe it was not um, secure to be shown to the client, we had to rearrange the API so that the users, our final user could see only the data that they needed to see. And at the same time, this was um, resulting in a heavy infrastructure because at the end of the day, to build the, this huge invoice, we were querying a lot of tables. We were left joining, aggregating, and some of our APIs were taking a lot to execute. We are talking about minutes, and this is, of course, it's not good for the customers. Um, in the meanwhile, Credimi was evolving. We got new people in the team, we got new skills, we got new ideas, and we started um, improving our infrastructure, adding new microservices, and also adopting new languages. We started with Python, we also added Rust, and at the same, at a certain point, also Kafka came into the stack. We started using Kafka as, of course, as aggregator of events, and we started switching from a REST API communication model towards a more event sourcing um, communication model. And we saw an opportunity here. So when we started adopting Kafka, it was clear that our right side was behaving really great, but our right side was kind of suffering from using REST APIs and from the fact that all our data were scattered around all the microservices. So we started thinking about taking all the events we were putting on Kafka and to materialize them into a database. In this way, we could really uh, start using SecureS, so we could also potentially have a different read side for each user type that was querying our API. And at the same time, we also wanted to modernize the stack. We, we heard a lot about GraphQL and how it potentially could solve our issues with, um, as I told by the uh, boilerplate authorization and heavy queries. So uh, the first step was to build the read side database. You can see a Postgres database in there is where we actually, um, we currently um, materialize all the events that we put on Kafka. And at this point, we started to, under, to, to try to understand how to expose that data to our front end. Um, and of course we could have written the server ourselves, but we preferred to rely on somebody that was that already had uh, experience with GraphQL. So we were looking for a tool that was easy to integrate with our architecture. So something that was dockerized and that we could just take the image and to plug it into our Kubernetes cluster. We wanted something that was easy to work with. Uh, I don't want my new resource in the team to be stuck waiting for somebody else to fix the, uh, the server or to expose a new field. I want that everybody can just with, with a couple of configurations set up what they need. And then we also found in time that it's, it's nice to work with a community that is able to share what they are doing with you and to start a collaboration. So eventually we decided to go with Azura. And this is more or less how Credimi works at the moment. We still have some REST API here and there, but more or less all the microservices, even if there are no arrows in there, are communicating with Kafka. They are publishing events. Those events are then materialized on our read side that is exposed through Azura to our front end. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how the developer experience looks like now. So the very first step that developers do, they meet up and they start to talk about the kind of resources that they need to develop the new feature. Uh, so they try to understand if the resources they need are already there if they need additional resources, additional fields, if they need additional uh, relationships between the tables, and uh, if they need to expose any new field with some particular layer of authorization. 
Basically, they are building the graph of the resources. And this point is really important because thanks to this, the developer can also get a grasp of the domain they're working into and they can bring better value to the feature they are developing. So the first step instead, kind of like a, uh, usually in Credimi, the at this point, the front-end developers, I, I put a cup of coffee there because literally they could wait for half an hour so that the environment is all set up. Or they also could mock the answer, the, the response that the server would give back to them and start to work immediately. But they just pretend for now that they just went to grab a cup of coffee and the backend developer starts to bring up a new environment where they can both work together. Um, we have our CI CD tool that can set up a new namespace on our Kubernetes cluster that is totally isolated from the other um, developing environments that we have up at the moment. Uh, so the namespace is going to have all the microservices that are needed to develop the feature a dedicated database that is going to act like the read side database we have in production and the other instance that is going to expose that read side. To do that, uh, I'm going to show you the repository that we actually use for bring up Hazra in a new namespace. This is, of course, just an extract of our repository. But you can see on the left hand side at the top level of the tree, there's this deployment.yaml file that tells our CI pipeline what it needs to do. The first thing our pipeline does, of course, is to run, to, is to run tests. You can see that in the tree, there's, there are both a Hasra folder and a migrations folder. The migrations folder, of course, contains all the migrations that needs to go on the read side database. And the reason why we have them in the same repository is because we are sure in this way that Hasra never breaks and it, that is always aligned with the version of Postgres we expect. So the first thing uh, we uh, the CICD pipeline does, we say, it, is to run the test. How does it do it? It brings up a Docker composition, one that has uh, the, a Postgres database where all the migrations are applied. And another container is going to run Hazura. And then the tests are going to be run. Note that... Um, when we started using Hazura, uh, Hazura still didn't have integration tests integrated in the tool. So we wrote our own tests in Python. Uh, so we do have both tests for the migrations and tests for the authorization fields. The tests in the Hazura folder actually check that depending on the type of token uh, we use for querying the server, we get back the fields we are supposed to get. So this is kind of like testing the authorization layer of Hazura. Uh, and the metadata.json file is what uh, help us to bring up uh, uh, the Hazura exactly as it is in production. Uh, it, it is the data that defines all the relationships and the authorization at field level that build up the graph. On the right hand side, you can see the Docker image that actually runs Hazura. It's just an, it's literally the that is the, the file. We get the image from Hazura, then we copy over the metadata file, JSON, and that's it. We have Hazura exactly as it's supposed to be plugged into our read side database. Uh, after the tests are run, our CI CD pipeline runs the migrations and brings up Hazura. And at that point, we do have a namespace in Kubernetes that is exact replica of what we have in production. Then at this point, to go on with the development process, if there's the need of any additional migration, the backend developer writes the migration, runs the new migration, and then if anything needs to be added on the GraphQL schema, the backend developer uh, modifies the metadata.json file that I have showed you before. Or she can go on the Hazura UI and she can, just clicking around, making the tables visible, the columns visible to uh, a specific user, then she exports the metadata dot file. And then at that point, that file is versioned. And this is also helpful in the phases of code review. Whenever a pull request is open, whoever code, code reviews that code can clearly see 
what has changed in terms of permissions on the metadata that are exposed by Hazora. Um, at this point, we have a namespace that is totally set up. Again, that the, it's ready for the, the development. The front end the developer comes back, uh, uses uh, Apollo to uh, introspect the graph on Hazura. And at this point, he can literally start writing code, whereas the back end developer can focus on some more fun stuff to do. Uh, note that at this point, if the PM comes back with yet another idea, and he decides that he doesn't want anymore to show uh, data X, Y, Z to the customer, but he wants instead to show, to show A, B, and C, the front-end developer is totally able to modify the metadata JSON file himself without waiting for the backend developer to modify the server. So, um, this is basically the conclusion of the talk. Uh, what I try to explain is that following this process, our developers have a better domain comprehension and they can have a, a really a great comprehension of the big picture so they can really focus on delivering value. Uh, and they stop writing most of the boilerplate they, they used to write. We are able to de de deliver feature faster, and why is that? Because thanks to the first step, the domain comprehension, we have a resource graph that is well defined and well understood from the developer. If the PM asks for modification, then it's trivial to go on uh, the Azura UI or to modify directly the graph, so the new data are exposed. Performance are improved. Remember at the beginning, I was explaining that we had these huge resources that were creating a lot of tables in a not efficient way. Uh, now, if the front end only has three of those 60 fields that we used to expose, then Hazura also queries only the tables that are involved and uh, APIs that used to take minutes now take milliseconds. And last but not least, the authorization. I don't need to care anymore that the user don't need to see certain fields of the invoice resource. I can just expose them all. And then at the at authorization layer, I'm going to expose to the, our customers only the fields they need to see. And I'm able to discriminate on the kind of customer using the token that is used to create the server. And that's it for the process um, we use in Credimi. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And thank you for tuning in.